They're like, we need more yeah. people. We need better people. We need to win more. They make blanket statements like that and they don't actually really understand what they're trying to fix or why. Um, and that's why they keep throwing stuff against the wall and why 70, 80% of that stuff fails, um, whether it's the people they choose to hire or their onboarding or their training or the outcomes they try and get out of their business because they don't actually solve the root cause because they don't even know what it is. Welcome. It is I, Coach K, and I have the man with me, David, and I should have asked you, Weiss? Weiss, Weiss. Let's go with Weiss. Weiss is good today. Yeah. Let's go with the what? No, really, what is it? It's Weiss. Yeah. It's Weiss? Okay. Let's go with Weiss. I have people who never say my last name right. So first off, how are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. I'm pumped for our conversation. Let's dig in. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about you. You've been an ex sales leader at places like Outreach, at Seismic, and other. You're a strategic advisor for several different places as well. You're an evangelist for MedPick, if I remember correctly. And then you also currently are obviously the CRO of the Sales Collective, which is a sales system and training company that focuses on being a third party to other companies to help them get an actual sales system that works. So you're the perfect person for this. So, um, what I'd love to hear is the stuff that's not on LinkedIn. So tell me more about you and your journey. Oh, it makes you passionate about what you do. Yeah, man. Um, I like to think I'm the person who, who can I swear? You you may swear. I might edit it out, but you can swear. <laughs> I'm gonna edit, if you're going to edit out, I won't swear. I'm okay. the person who's, who's messed up everything. I, I'm one of those guys that just, I love doing things, see, see what happens, and then very rapidly learn from mistakes. So if I was to go back like 20 years in my sales career, uh, I totally bombed my first few sales jobs. I didn't even know if I was going to stay in sales. I knew I was one of those people that, like to talk to others and had an extroverted personality and could learn things really quick. And I started thinking, do I, you know, maybe drop out and go back to grad school and, you know, get an MBA or something like that. Or I, and I saw sales as maybe one of the fastest paths with the lowest barrier of entry to make money. But I really, really underestimated in my early days, the profession, the science of sales. Yeah. So my first two early jobs, one of them not even on LinkedIn, very short stints at companies where I just didn't take sales training seriously. I didn't take the profession of sales seriously. I just showed up and didn't do a very good job. And I didn't know or have deep enough sales training around all the different facets of sales and how to manage time and territory and energy and how to do all the things that I now teach people to do. A lot. Right. There's so much. Okay. It was in my third sales job that I said, okay, I'm going to give this one last chance. I'm going to actually lean into the profession of selling. I'm going to join a company that is well regarded as having some of the best sales training in the world. And I'm going to just surrender. I'm going to let God take the wheel. I will do whatever they tell me to do. Right. Whatever it is. They train me, I will do it. And I did. And I became one of the top 5% against 300 sellers in the first year. Awesome. And then I spent five years being a top performer for them and then got recruited and trained by another company and then eventually went over to ADP that also has some of the best sales training in the world. And they taught me how to be a leader. In my first few leadership gigs, just like my first few sales gigs, I failed it at every aspect of leadership. Right. I tried to create a bunch of mini-me's. Um, I tried to get everyone to do what I did. I focused on command and control and telling people what to do. And it wasn't until I formally embraced the fact that leadership is a science that's different than sales and, yeah. and actually leaned into it just like I did my sales career that I actually somewhat became good at that. So lots of failure, lots of restarts, lots of figuring out intentionality behind things. That's yeah. a lot of the stuff that you just don't see. That's amazing. So how uh, you've gone through that path and now you're at the sales collective, which is all about scaling that for other teams. What is it that you do now that makes you nerd out of what you do? Yeah. So sales collective, we worked with 300 B2B startups last year. So those are companies between yep. five and 30 million. I nerd out around systems. So I don't believe in silver bullets. There's no one piece of tech or process or hiring or training or developing people or coaching or whatnot. That's a silver bullet. I'm a big believer that there's foundational elements of success. It starts with putting the right people in the right places, training and developing them to onboard them quick into a business, putting them yeah. into the right process, enabling them with the right tech, and then over time coaching and developing them to a point of mastery. And everyone goes through a cycle of, I'm new at something, I'm learning to be good, I think I got it, 
I realize all the things I don't know. And then eventually, you know, getting to a point of mastery. Um, and I, I feel like businesses need to properly, you know, get people in all of those different areas to actually have long-term success. And to me, those are all systems, independent systems that combine into a master system. Um, right. That's what I geek out. I love it, man. Spring off of what you just said, um, once upon a time, I sold for a guy who I sold success coaching packages. One of his core principles was you can put a mediocre person in a really good system and they'll have success. Whereas you put a really good person in a bad system and the system will kill them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tell me, do you agree with that? Like, tell me what you see with, with businesses and bad systems versus good ones. So I look at it as not success or failure. I look at it as speed to revenue. So if you put a um, really good person and a bad system, they're just likely going to buck all aspects of the system and one or two things will happen. Um, the system will give in and let the really good person do what they want um, or or the person will leave. So in that right. you have a highly impacted speed to revenue because you've got this great person who wants to do good things and you're just holding them back. And then on the flip to that, you have a really great system and a mediocre person. Um, their speed to revenue is going to be fairly quick, but their ability to, you know, become a top one or 5%, um, regardless of your system, you're likely not going to get there. They may be a top quartile performer, but are they going to be top one, top 5%, you know, not so much probably, but you at least got them speed to revenue faster by having the really good system. I'm a believer that you need to put the right people in the right seats. You need right. good people in good systems. And when you do, when you make that thing work, you have just tremendous upside as a business. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions, but before I do, I want to give some context. So the systems you're referring to mm -hmm. are um, hiring the process. Tell me more about what systems you create when you go into these businesses you work with. Yeah. Three main systems, um, systems for hiring, um, systems for process, and then systems for training. And everything we do falls into to those three buckets. Love it. When you bring in systems, obviously the system itself is what you're bringing to the table. But what is it most people are missing when you come in that you're like, hey, let's just fix this problem with the system? What do you see as a usual common trait? Yeah, it's we have a hiring problem. It's now you've got a, a culture and comp and onboarding problem. Oh, um, we have a closing problem. You don't have a closing problem. <laughs> you have a discovery problem. You have a business yeah. case problem. You have a metric problem. You have a differentiation problem. Um, you have a failure to communicate the message to executives. Um, that's the problem. Um, our people take six months or 12 months to onboard. Um, you have a playbook onboarding documentation problem. So the, a lot of folks honestly don't even know the, the root cause of, of what they're trying to solve for. They're like, we need more yeah. people. We need better people. We need to win more. They make blanket statements like that, and they don't actually really understand what they're trying to fix or why. Um, and that's why they keep throwing stuff against the wall and why 70, 80% of that stuff fails, um, whether it's the people they choose to hire or their onboarding or their training or the outcomes they try and get out of their business because mm -hmm. they don't actually solve the root cause because they don't even know what it is. So what do you think is the difference? Obviously, you guys now have systems. What, what's the magic behind what you guys do to identify this is actually your core versus what you think the core is and how do you go about changing it? Yeah, so a lot of it goes is through assessment and auditing. Yeah. So both before we sell people things and then during the onboarding process of the work we do with companies, um, we assess all of their people against 25 core competencies. And these competencies have been vetted, validated, taken by 2.4 million salespeople, have been shown to have a 92% accuracy of predicting top performance within a business. So we first look at the people. We then look yeah. at the processes. We then look at the training and the onboarding. Um, we look at how you choose to hire. So essentially, like a doctor would, we examine your systems and yeah. we find gaps in your understanding of your systems, your people, um, things that are missing or not. And then we look to work with you to build that. Let me double click in the competencies. I think that's something I've talked about with other podcasts with people before. When you say competencies, define that for me. Does that mean a skill, knowledge, behavior? What is that? So um, when we look at competencies, we break them down into three specific areas. Mm -hmm. um, the first area is will. So when we think about mm -hmm. will, um, 
so many folks are focused on skill-based competencies. Can they hunt? Can they reach decision makers? Can they sell value? Can they be consultative? Can they no negotiate? Those are important, but it's just like a, a race car with no gas, if you will. Yeah. If you lack will, you do not have the ability to take advantage of your skill. And so one of the first things we look at is will. And, and yeah. these are things like desire. Do I want to be the best at what I'm doing? Commitment. Am I committed to actually doing the things that need to happen to be the best? Do I, because if you're not committed, you can have all the desire in the world. I have a ton of desire to lose weight. I don't go to the gym. Low commitment. Okay. It's that concept. Mm -hmm. um, outlook. Do I have the ability to control the world around me? Responsibility. Do I blame everybody else or do I blame myself when things go wrong? So am I coachable? And then am I motivated internally? If you have internal motivation, you get out of bed every day because you want to get out of bed every day. If you're coin operated and have a lot of extrinsic motivation, you're constantly looking for the rest of the world to motivate you. And that could be good in sales, just throw more money yeah. at people, but you need to be internally motivated. So I look at will, then I look at beliefs and those are self-limiting beliefs. And I'll look at eight different self-limiting beliefs that people have. That's comfortable discussing money and handling rejection and needing approval. It's things like that. And then I look at skills. So I do the two that you're looking at, beliefs, tactical skills, but then I also layer in will because without the will, you can't, all the rest doesn't matter. Yeah. Which I, I love you looking at that. So question is sometimes I should say sometimes always will is an internal thing. So how do you assess someone's will when it is this internal motivation? Because sometimes it is an external motivation. Sometimes it's internal, but how do you get that accurate? Yeah. So part of the assessment that we've designed is it's literally built in there and through, um, lines of questioning, we can actually determine someone's will. It's the only assessment on the market that actually focuses on will. That's cool. Yep. I love it. Uh, this might be a good time to talk about competency-based scoring. So tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, competency-based scoring, competency-based training. What we're trying to do is marry these concepts. So one of the things that companies struggle with is um, figuring out, they, they do one-size-fits-all training or this big bang one to two days of training and then complain that it doesn't didn't work. It's right. literally 72% of all sales training fails. And it right. fails because it is diametrically opposed. It is misaligned to um, the outcomes that a business needs. So to me, I look at what outcome are we looking at? What behaviors drive that outcome? What indicators of behavior can we then align positive and negative? And then because of that, what yep. competencies need to be improved on? And then once you improve those competencies, the outcome should happen. But then you also need to layer in a coaching protocol on top of that for consistency. So it's how do you build that framework? And what we're doing is, and it's the only sales training on the market that's going to be assessment led. We're going to assess people on the 25 core competencies that align to will, beliefs, and skills. And then we've, based on where we see deficiency to a, an established target, we are assigning a custom learning path. And this custom learning path could be rooted in will. Just like you said, it's hard to assess will. We can, right. but then it's hard to improve it because it's all here. So we've actually right. partnered with PhD psychologists to um, create a training program based on desire, commitment, outlook, responsibility, and motivation, where we can help people connect to their bigger purpose in life, where we can help people learn to personally take responsibility for their outcomes, where we can help people learn to connect their job today to the future job they want and the success that they need to have today to lead to the future. We're build, we've built a training program to improve will. And then we've also mm -hmm. built it for the other things as well. So when we assess someone, it will report back against those 25 core competencies and then we'll build automatically custom learning paths for every single person we assess. So people are, are getting trained and in, in improving tied to specific outcomes, behaviors, indicators, and competencies, and then coached directly where they need it. So we close gaps in the, those major areas. And the theory mm -hmm. is if you can close the gaps of deficiency, you can create a more well-rounded seller that can then have a bigger impact. And then you can further do strengths-based coaching from there. I love that. Well, and I also love that you're focusing on both internal and external, because sometimes, like you said, it, measuring and assessing internal is freaking hard, which means most people don't do it because it's, right. you know, how do you do that? Um, but but question for you is part of the purpose of the podcast is to really understand the gap in between, um, you know, where the plan is, you say this, what you're doing, the systems, the plans, then when you're in the field, actually with customers and actually getting it done and executed. 
How does your system help people when it comes to execute on whatever the thing might be with the customer? How, how do you do that now to make sure they have either the real-time enablement or to rely on training or something to make sure they can win? Does that make sense, hopefully? Yeah, man. So, so much of this is defining the outcome. So one of the things I mentioned very early on, root cause analysis, we really want to figure out what are you trying to achieve? Why can't you achieve it today? And what's holding you back from being successful? So if a client said, hey, we need to win more, I wouldn't just take on that client. Okay. I would look at why you're losing because it could be your product. It could be your messaging, could be your people. There's a lot of things. So much of what you need to do is is root cause analysis. Um, And then once you have established what the root cause is, you need to then say to yourself, okay, what behaviors need to change? Because you can't do what you've always done. You'll get what you've always got. You need to actually change behavior and through behavior change outcomes happen. So then it starts going to what behaviors need to change. And then it goes to what are the positive and negative indicators of those behaviors? What does good look like? What does bad look like? Where are we today across every single person? And then it's okay, cool. Now that we know the outcome we want, we know who's dragging the outcome or not. We know what behaviors need to look like, positive and negative. We can now design something that can change to create positive behavior change. And then from there, you can start driving outcome change. And I think that's so much of what we're trying to help organizations see is that once you can identify the positive and negative indicators of behavior, you can start coaching to behavior change. And so as an example for any leader that's listening to this, just think about the behaviors that you would want change. Think about what good looks like and what you may be right. seeing today. And then build an individual development plan. That's one of the things that we do very tactically with our clients is we build what we call IDPs, individual development plans. That's literally someone's name, the behavior we want changed, the four to five actions that they would take in those 30 days that we want to see to change those, the exact how. Then you meet with somebody, you review it, you gain their agreement on it, and then you as a leader every single week just look for those behaviors, have them demonstrate those behaviors to you, role play with them, record calls, watch calls. Join them in the yeah. field, look for those things, coach them on those things, and then you consistently work on it over time. And you can't get more tactical at coaching and improvement than that. How do you feel with all the stuff coming out with AI, whether it's AI role play or all the tools are at people's disposal? Where do you see tech coming in to help take this to the next level? Or do you see that coming to help with this? No, I, I really do. Um, one of the top things <clears throat> that leaders say is, I don't have enough time to coach my people. Well, right what the hell are you doing? You may want to stop everything else you're doing and just do that and lead you to better outcomes. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that's for a different day. Um, Good AI is helping with that. Um, I'm advising multiple companies. You know, I know GTM Buddy does it. Um, There's a lot of AI that's coming out that is both listening to calls like this in real time, analyzing emails, call recordings, social interactions and things happening in, in various spheres and bringing insight to reps, you know, on ideas and things that they can do. Um, I think all of that's really good. It's all down to the model being used, how well it's trained, um, how much data it's being fed. So there's still a lot of what I can call infancy and inaccuracy inside of it. But yeah. for the ones that have been designed properly, it, it's a great leg up. Uh, some of the companies that I'm advising are listening to every call, reading every email, um, looking at notes, looking at, you know, everything that is happening inside the deal and then, you know, providing health scores and ideas and actions that reps can take, um, to, you know, move the deal forward or close gaps. And, you know, I love that stuff. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, it's early, um, but it's way more than it's existed in the past. It's giving reps at least ideas and insights that they didn't have, or that maybe they only relied on their leader for, and their leader didn't have time to do it. So, um, you know, net, net benefit at least. Yeah, I saw that one time you were uh, um, advising for replays, as an example. It's freaking yeah. cool tech to look at all these different things, you know? Yeah, man. Um, and I see more and more of that happening to where you can get that personalized feedback in a way that could help whatever coaching conversation be really, really specific versus just saying, broadly, I got to go back and watch a call, you know? Yeah. Um, Re- replays is a great example that they've, yeah. you know, analyzed hundreds of thousands of calls. They've created, you know, their framework for what good calls look like across you know, many, many different pillars of what makes up a good call. And then they're doing spider graphs on like, okay, cool. That call, you did these things. You missed these things. You may want to think about these things. Um, And that's the, and and doing it, you know, in seconds at scale 
Like yeah. that's real time call score. Like that stuff's super beneficial. Um, right. Dave Kennett, CEO of Replace, he's done a great job of training the model. So it's very accurate. Not everyone has. So that's the problem with AI. And that's one of the things that I challenge anyone listening to this to. You know, there's a lot of cool tech out there, but so much of AI is based on the model that has been used to train it and the level of, and robustness of right. it. And so you got to be really careful about, you know, what you choose to, you know, invest that's in. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Um, going back for a second, when you walk in to a CRO of a company, wh whatever size it might be, what are the things you look for as red flags? You're saying this is a leader who's not willing to work. And what do you look for leadership that's, okay, this is someone I can work with? Make yeah. sense? So much of it is, I mean, for me, do they have, you know, level of process systems, change management, coaching, um, things along those lines. If the leader isn't willing to change anything that they're doing, yeah. I don't want to work with them because right. it starts with them. And so many leaders want to hire people like me and they're like, go fix sales. It's like, cool. You know, part of that is we're going to install a process. Are you, you know, going to help us build it? And are you going to hold them accountable to following it? Well, you know, I'm not a big sales process guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> ah, well, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't work together. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm looking for leaders that want to be really thoughtful about the change. They want, they understand that it's behavior change top down um, yep. and that they need to be one of the spears and tips of the spear helping drive that change. And that's their own behavior. I really like working with executives that are cool. I don't know everything. I'm hiring you to help be a thought partner with me. We're going to build new systems. We're going to, you know, create new things. We're going to implement new tech, new processes, new training. Um, we're going to change the way we hire and onboard people. And again, you know, through the bigger picture, we're going to solve the problem. And it's when leaders either are scared to change, aren't willing to drive the change, don't take ownership of them themselves and, and their outcomes. You know, what we normally do is just bring everybody in for two days and do this big sales training. And yeah. we've been doing that for 10 years. It's like, so how much do people remember? Oh, well, not a lot, but that's what we've been doing for 10 years. Okay. Do you want to do something different? No. I'm like, well, I'm not the guy for you. Um, right. So, you know, that that's so much of it is like, you know, just like I said a second ago, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. Like you need to be willing to change the way you do things. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I was a part of a study literally last week where we um, looked at sales reps, sales leaders and enablement and asking questions on what do you think enablement is? And the number one response of 20 different options was sales training. Um, and then at the same time, we also found out that the view of all three parties of how much impact the enablement has towards quota is not very much. But yeah, everyone says it's sales training. I'm like, oh my gosh. So Because we were talking about this before. Sales training to me is a tool that I use in enablement if and when I need to do it. But it's usually something that's I use 10% of the time versus 90% of the time like most people. And I think you have the same kind of um, thought process. Like for you, when you look at good enablement, when you walk into somewhere and you get all these systems up and running and it's working, training's on enablement. What, how would you define good enablement inside of an org except for training? Take training out. What what else is it besides that? It's all sales training, man. You know that. Good enablement's just, it's very holistic. It starts with, you know, hiring the right people, onboarding them properly. Um, training is absolute part of it. Um, but then it's, you know, the right coaching behaviors and our leaders yeah. doing that so much of an it's funny one of the biggest things people miss is they hire enablement to replace the field leaders need to coach and it's like well we've got enablement here they do that and it's enablement can't be in every single call you know they they can't replace the frontline sales leader they can enable the frontline sales leader by teaching the frontline sales leader how to be a better coach they can give yeah. them the tools, reporting, technology, processes, et cetera, to be a better coach and give them visibility into the areas that they need to spend time on. But ultimately, it's still the job of the frontline sales leader to coach their damn people. And that's one of the biggest missing links in sales outcomes is the coach is sales leaders doing good coaching. Uh, it's like having a, a football team that the coach doesn't actually tell the people where they need to focus and improve. It's the same. That wouldn't be a successful yep. team. Um, enablement to me is very holistic, um, tools, processes, hiring people, yes, training, 
yes, real time. I need this thing. What should I do? Playbooks, answers, assets, content, you know, measurable execution, you know, mm -hmm. the concept that we were talking about call recording and actions based on that and the playbooks required and competitive Intel and all that stuff. It's all not stuff. En enablement. If you focus on any one piece, you often miss the whole, you fail. It, it needs to be approached very holistically to me to drive the right type of success. I know we talked about, and I'll end with probably one or two more questions. We'll let you out of here. Um, but we talked about the CROs, what they do, red flags. Do you ever walk in to an org that has an enablement function and they're like, they're just not, whatever reason, not cutting it? What is it you see they're doing or not doing that is the problem you have to go in and quote unquote fix? Yeah, man. A lot of it is um, they are managing content in a platform. Right. <laughs> um. And doing what I consider flavor of the month spot training. And it's normally those two things. And is content managed in a platform important? Absolutely. Do people need playbooks to know what to do and when and what assets to send and what to present to people and all those need to be up to date? No doubt. Is spot training on key initiatives important? Absolutely. But there's so much of it is done without a strategy. It was done without a specific outcome. So much of it is done without sales leadership support. So much of it is done without frontline sales leaders even knowing that it's happening so they can't support and drive it. Um, it's done in vacuums in bubbles and yeah. it isn't holistic and it isn't, supported by the entire team that's when things just need to be fixed <laughs> i would agree with you i think that there's kind of a dual edged sword with this because some fault of that is on the enablement person but the other fault is on the leaders because they're right. not it's a two-sided thing it's not just one side you know right. and it's really easy i've worked with CROs in the past that literally would give me a different big project to do almost on a daily basis i'm like which one do you want me to work on because i can't do all of them you know yeah um, so all and I'm why? doing is just reacting to, uh, and why probably because the CRO heard some weird discovery call and then that becomes the thing. And then he hears about right. the negotiation. Somebody on like, LinkedIn it, said we should do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, oh my gosh. And then it's really easy because I've been there as an enable person to, cause it's your boss. I want to make sure he's happy. So I'm going to do what he wants me to do, but he doesn't know what he's doing, you know, as far as enable is concerned. Um, so it's an interesting balance between the two. Um, I'll end with this, which is that gap you see with both leaders and with enablement. And with all the people you've you've consulted with Sales Collective, what what would be like one thing to take away from this and say today, no matter what you do, look at this one thing and make sure that's happening. What would that be? Uh, that your frontline sales leaders are are spending time coaching their team every week. Yeah, watching at least one call per person and giving them positive and constructive, highly tactical areas that they can improve. Hey, I saw you do this. Keep doing that. I also saw you do this. It, we may want to work on how to reframe that. Let's work on this piece together and, and then put a plan in place. Just do that. You do that. Your team will be infinitely better if you do that every single week. Like that right there, it moves mountains, man. I agree with you. I said once in a podcast a long time ago that if all a team did was focus on just coaching and then what you just said, they would kill it, but no one ever does. <laughs> Yeah, it is hard, but it's hard and takes time. I, I love it. Well, David, thank you so much. Been a pleasure. And I just want to say thank you and look forward to more from you, man. Jonathan, appreciate you having me on, sir. Thank you. No problem, man.